the saints above with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like the whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. Thou faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love of flame will vanquish all the hosts of night. In Jesus' conquering name, faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. You may be seated. Y'all know as um, a joyful noise, Richard, y'all know as Baptists, if we get off schedule, if we deviate from the bulletin, we can't have church. Y'all know that, don't you? Oh, man, I was really looking forward to that uh, Graves in the Garden, but we'll get it. Anybody check this out on Facebook? Um, we, we've sang it the last two weeks, but we've been snowed in and iced out and everything else. Anybody listen to us online? Check that song out. Y'all like that one? That's, that's a pretty good one. So uh, we had a, a pretty congregational, friendly version of it. I gave you kind of the... Uh, the more in-your-face version, but uh, we were going to sing a little more congregational, friendly version, but we'll get it next week. And I appreciate our guys upstairs. We actually have um, our tech guy here who sold us equipment and is, who is helping us with our streaming, so he is in-house today. Y'all give uh, him a round of applause. I appreciate his extra effort knowing that um, he probably has 10,000 other things to do, but we're glad he's here helping us. And Ken, we thank you, and Ronnie, and Nancy. So here's what I've tried to make a practice of doing. Every time something don't go as planned with our audio, our video, uh, I try to compliment them and, and encourage them because nobody does that unless something goes wrong. And then normally it's like, my mic's dead. I need some speaker. Turn it up. Turn it down. So we thank them because that's a sacrifice. They're not down here with us. They're not... Ken's not able to sit with his wife. Mike's up there, too. you so short, I couldn't see you through the window. <laughs> I love you, Mike. Um, but anyways, we have a good team here. I love what God's doing. I'm glad that I'm a part of it. I'm glad he called uh, my family and I here. Thank you, Nancy. She was up there, too, for a minute. Um, so, man, it, it takes a church to do church, don't it? One person can't do it, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. So I love y'all and appreciate what you're doing. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, this is the sixth installment of our series, um, Faith Over Fear. And this week is the shouting week. Miss Linda tried to get y'all warmed up. I, I brought my horn. Uh huh? All right. If you don't shout, I'm going to come out there and beat you with it. Right? I ain't going to beat you with it. Um, and I might not even blow the thing. I've, I've tried it this morning and it sounded awfully awful. But anyway. Um, but this is shouting week, and we have, we've stacked our 12 stones. Somebody put these in the offering a few weeks ago, and I said, I know what I'm going to do with them stones. Put them together and put them on the pulpit until we get done with our series in Joshua. So we have stacked stones. We're getting ready to blow a horn and shout. And uh, we know, as the song says, and the walls came tumbling down. Joshua didn't fight the Battle of Jericho. It was, it was God. He fought the Battle of Jericho. Um, they did have a part in it, and Joshua had a part. But today, uh, we want to look at the victory lap. We want to we look at the victory lap there in Joshua chapter 6. So we're going to read the first 20 verses. And I uh, hope you have found your place in your copy of God's Word, or either you have turned on your copy of God's Word and have found Joshua chapter 6. 
And if you have, I would encourage you to stand. And out of reverence for reading God's word, it's one of our one of our members texting in here, distracting me from reading. <laughs> but anyway, Joshua chapter six. We'll read the first twenty verses, then you can be seated. I'll pray and we'll preach. Uh, now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, I need to circle this or remember this, see, he says, see, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. So we're going to pause right here and shout. Y'all ready to shout? I know this is a Baptist church. But on three, and if y'all make me out to be the fool right here and I'm the only one shouting in here, we're going to do it again. <laughs> and we'll continue to do it until you shout with me. So it says, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. So on three, we're going to shout with a great shout. And you can say whatever you think you'd have said if you was marching around the city so long as this church appropriate. Okay? <laughs> all right, on three, here we go. We're going to shout with a great shout. One, two, three. Jesus! <laughs> Amen. Y'all shouted. Then the wall of the city fell down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Verse 6. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priest and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant. Let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was. When Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout, like y'all just did. Verse 11, so he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But listen to verse 15. But it came to pass. How many times have we heard, and it came to pass in Joshua? Every time something good is about to happen, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early. About the dawning of the day, now, some of y'all don't know that, but that's when the sun comes up. It's usually shining bright by the time most of y'all get out of bed. The dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time, what does the Bible say? It happened. The seventh time, it happened. The seventh day, the seventh lap, it happened. When the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab, y'all remember her from Joshua chapter 2, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain, listen to this very carefully, because this is for next week, and you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the whole camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now tuck that away because you're going to read Joshua 7 this week and you're going to see a man named Achan. And you're going to understand what God's talking about here. Verse 19, But all the silver, all the gold, the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. 
Listen to verse 20 and we'll be done. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. You may be seated and then we will pray and preach. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Joshua. I thank you for inspiring him. I thank you for calling him, ordaining him, appointing him, leading him. I thank you that through Joshua's life we can see the life of a great leader. We see the traits of a good leader. Lord, in Joshua we see a picture of Jesus. Although Jesus is a greater Joshua and a better Joshua, we see that leader who takes the people over. We, we see the one who lays down his life for the sake of others. We see the one who carries on. We see the one who, who meets with the living God on the edge of the enemy city. We see the one who is in control and who has the power and who has the authority because of who God is and because of what he has called Joshua to do. So Father, today we say thank you for the parallel and the transparency that we can see when we lay the book of Joshua on top of the New Testament. Lord, we see that picture of Jesus. We see that great leader. We see that better leader. We see that complete leader. We see God in the flesh. Thank you for sending King Jesus, Lord, to lead us not into eternal life only, but to lead us into victory every day. Thank you for providing Jesus who provided a sacrifice, who provides victory for us every day. Thank you for the blood that was spilled on Calvary, Lord. We understand that every sacrifice in the Old Testament pointed to what you were ultimately going to do through your son, Jesus. We realize that we deserve death. We realize that by our sins we have earned death. It is our wages. But we also understand that the gift of God is eternal life. We understand that the gift of God is the victorious life, the Christ life, the life that is every day walking in victory because every day with Christ is a day of victory. So, Father, I pray that we wouldn't just see a history lesson concerning a, a walled city that falls down and is defeated by your people, but we would see Jesus for who he is and what he has done today. Father, I pray we would shout with a great shout. Lord, we wouldn't quit too soon. We would follow through. We would follow you. And because of that, we would walk in victory. I pray today, Father, that you'd give every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room faith over fear. Lord, we're done with fear. We're walking by faith, not by sight. Father, I pray let it be done to bring glory and honor to you. And we pray that you'd be preeminent in this room today. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all about had me preaching while I was supposed to be praying. Y'all do that all the time. Shouting while I'm reading the Bible. What's wrong with y'all? Rowdy bunch. How many of y'all, now we're going to check y'all's trivia this morning. How many of y'all, the name Alan Kowicki rings the bell? Wow. Now, raise them hands again. I thought I was, well, well, I'm fairly ignorant. Somebody tell me who Alan Kowicki is. I know we had some ride or die NASCAR fans. I'm from a NASCAR town, Rockingham, North Carolina. We had a NASCAR track. We had two races a year, and I did not know who in the world Alan Kowicki was until I did some research. Of course, he was known for what I've titled my sermon after today, the victory lap. The term was actually coined after Kowicki won the Checker 500 at Phoenix, Arizona, and he took a, what's called a Polish victory lap. He went the opposite direction. Instead of turning left four times, he turned right four times. He went around the track and he made a victory lap. He, he had to precede that victory lap by those 312 laps that he made prior to that last one. His name was nicknamed Special K or the Polish Prince. And I thought, nobody in the world is going to know who Alan Kowicki is. But i got to have some history for my, my title, the victory lap. Where did it even come from? Well, it came from him. And so, you know, you think about the victory lap and you think about his endurance, you think about his perseverance through the 312 laps leading up to that one is what made that one lap the victory lap. I thought it was pretty interesting because what we have here in Joshua is we see that after 40 years of doubting God, a rebellious and hard-hearted nation have died. Their corpses have fallen to the ground. 
then from the desert or from the wilderness emerged a different kind of generation, a generation that would overthrow their father's failures and launch an insurrection against unbelief because for 40 years they had not believed God. They had not circumcised their children, remember? They had not observed Passover, remember? They had not set up altars, remember? Where's my 12 stones? They hadn't done those things. They hadn't put God first. But a revolution of faith was born in the wilderness. A revolution of obedience was born. A revolution of victory. A generation of radicals that believed God when it didn't make sense. That believed God when it wasn't possible. That believed God when it looked improbable. That believed God when the enemy seemed to be in control. A different kind of generation. This was a different kind of soldier. This was a different kind of battle for a different kind of land. This was not the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. This was the possession of a promise. This was people walking in victory because God said they already had the victory. This was a life of victory, but what would make this life a life of victory is their obedience leading up to it, hence the first five chapters of Joshua, where God says, I'm not so concerned about your enemy as much as I'm concerned about you and your relationship with me. Have you seen that in the five chapters of Joshua? Because my first perspective when I started studying this was, God, you better kill them Canaanites. <laughs> They're going to get us. Take care of them. And the whole time God's been saying, you don't worry about them Canaanites. You worry about your relationship with me. Because I'm not really needing to work on the enemy. I need to work on you. There's things that I need to trim away from you, take away from you, cut away from you. There's some things you've not been doing that you should have been doing. There's some, there's some relational issues in our relationship that need to be addressed before you're ever going to go forward and walk in victory. And so... God has been doing that for five chapters, and now comes the victory lap, which would be really the first battle in their conquest of the promised land or Canaan land. And so the victory lap for Israel is just like the victory lap for old Kowicki. It's predicated on a promise. It's predicated on that there's a finish line. It's predicated on the fact that for Israel, God has promised the victory. Now for Kowicki, NASCAR has promised the first man to... Past the finish line on lap 321 is the winner. God's people, God said, hey, here's the victory lap if you walk with me. So for Israel, their victory lap is predicated on a promise. In other words, you've got to see it, which is why I drew your attention to verse 2. He says, and the Lord said to Joshua, see, exclamatory, see. See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. And the issue with, with this seeing that God has given, and he did say that, didn't he? All right, y'all going to have to help me. We missed our first song. We did shout, but he did say, see, didn't he, that I have given you Jericho. But, but what does the verse in front of that say? Securely shut up. No one gets in. No one gets out. It's like Hotel California. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. All right, three of y'all's awake. We gonna we uh, we got it. That's the Eagles, by the way. I know y'all know that. It's not in the Baptist hymnal, but y'all know that one. <laughs> anyway, their victory lap is predicated on a promise. God says, "See, I have given you victory." And my thought is, "See, no, you ain't." See, the city is shut up. See, there's two walls. See, one's about three foot thick. See, the other one's about ten foot thick. See, one's about ten foot tall. See, the other one's about fifteen foot tall. See, God, people live between that wall. That's a big wall. There's two walls. I don't have a hammer to break them. See, God, you have not given me victory. And how many times do we say that in our life? See, God, and God says, see, I've given you victory. Walk in it. See, I have given you faith. Walk in it. See, I have given Jericho into your hand. See what? And all we can see are walls. Now, y'all going to make me come out there and preach. We got a new camera, and I'm about to check out and see how fast they can move and how quick they can zoom. <laughs> y'all better help me. They are some walls. All we can see are walls of depression. Anybody? All we can see are walls of anxiety. All we can see are walls of addiction. All we can see are walls of death. All we can see are walls of broken relationships. All we can see are walls of opposition. All we can see are walls put up by the enemy. All we can see are walls of self. 
and we can't even see God's promise because of the walls. Have you been there? God, I know you promised me victory, but every day it looks like defeat. I mean, I've walked around this wall already, and I've not found a place I can get in yet. I've walked around here. There's no way I can squeeze in anywhere. Every door is locked. Every window is latched. See what, God? See what? I can't see the promise because of the walls. They're too big. I can't break them. I can't scale them. I can't go over them. I can't go under them. I can't go around them. Y'all ever heard, told that story? I got to go through them. I can't see no problem. Promise all I see is problems, and they abound. All I see is opposition, and there's plenty of it. See what, God? And God says, see that I am working. See that I am growing you. See that the enemy is defeated. You say, see, this is not positive thinking. This is walking by faith. Because every day it looks like defeat. Positive thinking says, I can climb that wall. Reality says, no, you can't. Faith says you can't climb the wall. God will crush it for you. And so every day they were circling the wall and God says, see that I'm working on you. See, I have given you the victory. Now, what tense is God telling this to the children of Israel in? Past tense. I have given you victory. I have given you the city. In other words, it's already yours. Here's what God says to the New Testament believer. I have already given you life. You have it more abundantly. Do not walk around in defeat. Do not walk around in depression. Do not walk around in sin. Walk in victory. Do not walk in fear. Hello, 2021. Walk in faith. I have given you victory. Well, what does that look like, preacher? That looks like believing God when he says, I have given it. And then he gives orders to do what? Get the jackhammers out. Get the torches out. Get the tanks out. Have your artillery out. Then come the directions to do what? Walk. One foot in front of the other. Is it really that simple, preacher? Yes and amen. It's really that simple. One, I don't feel like I can go another. Yes, you can. I don't feel like I can take another. Yes, you can. How can I? Because God's already given you victory. I can't take another death. Yes, you can. I can't take another disease. Yes, you can. I can't take another piece of poverty in my life. Yes, you can. I can't take another breakdown. Yes, you can. I can't take another family member disgruntled with me. Yes, you can. I can't take another business deal going sour. Yes, you can because I'm not working on them I'm working on you. And what I'm trying to do is show you that I love you and I'm in a relationship with you and I will protect you. I've already given you the victory. Now walk. Walk. Go. Man, we focus on our problems and we miss God's promises. And God says, see that I'm working. See that I'm in control. See that I'm greater. See that I'm bigger. See that I'm stronger. And we already talked about comparing our giants with ourselves. And here's what's going to happen every time. You're going to get intimidated because you're smaller than your giants. You should compare your giants, your Canaanites, to your God who is much bigger, much stronger, much faster, more faithful. He can do it all. He can defeat them. I don't know what your giant is. I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what your wall is. I don't know what your pet sin is. I don't know what your hang-up or your hiccup is. Here's what I can tell you. My God is bigger than that. Bigger. Much bigger. And he says, I have given you Victory. Walk in it. Don't walk with your head down. Walk in victory. I've called you to move. Walk. Fear says, what promise? All I see is problems. Faith says, I see a problem, but I've been here before. Faith says, my forefather stood on the shore of the Red Sea, and God was faithful. Joshua says, I stood on the shores of the Red Sea, and God was faithful. This generation can say, I do see a problem. There's a Jordan in front of me, but God has stopped it before and heaped it up on itself and made it stand up like a wall and let us walk across on dry land. I, I, faith says the problem exists. Positive thinking says there's no problem. Just go ahead. Just march on. There is no problem. That's positive thinking, and that's a bunch of baloney. Here's what God's Word says. The problem exists. The problem is real, but you've been here before. I've, I've taken you through it before. 
You, you see, the situation, and we talked about this earlier in Joshua, it's not unique, it's just unique to you. And God says, look, I've done it before and I'll do it again, walk. I, I've taken care of you before and I'll do it again. I mean, I brought bread down from heaven and fed you behind. You wanted some protein in your life, so I brought quail in on a west wind so much that you thought it was all you could eat buffet and it come out your nose. I mean, I fed you bread, I fed you meat. You said you were thirsty, I sent a rock. The Bible tells us his name is Jesus, and that's where the living water came from, and it flowed so that you could eat, so that you could drink. I've taken care of you, walk in victory. I have given you the city. My glory is at stake, God says. I have given, and if he has not given them victory, then God's a liar. But as we read on, God's not a liar, and he's always faithful. And he says, listen, your victory lap is predicated on a promise. I have given you victory. Their victory lap is also confirmed by consistency. Look at verses 7 through 14, and here's where it really gets, gets real. Y'all let me spend almost 10 minutes on the first point. When y'all get tired of listening, say, move on, preacher, and then I'll give you five more minutes, and we'll move on. Okay. Confirmed by consistency, man, in these verses 7 through 14, there's something missing. Because here's what we got. Here's what we got from God to Joshua early on. And remember, this is God talking to Joshua, not Joshua talking to the people. You see, the instructions come from God to his man. Then his man, who is his mouthpiece, delivers the message to his people. And it's really how it works in the church. And we believe God can speak to anybody anytime. But we also agree that God has appointed pastors and leaders of churches that he instills a word into to give to his people. And so when I deliver a message, I'm not giving you my opinion or my thoughts or my philosophy. I'm giving you what thus saith the Lord. Joshua's doing the same thing. So God has talked to Joshua. And here's what he says. He says, you shall march around the city, all your men of war, go around the city. This you'll do for six days. And they shall batter, bear the trumpets. But the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. They'll blow the trumpet. It'll come to pass. You'll, make a, you'll hear it. You'll shout. Great shout. Walls come down. This is God to Joshua. Did y'all get all that? That was a real quick synopsis of the first six verses. Here's the problem. When Joshua goes to the people, he says, march. And there's a, there's a problem here because he told them to, soldiers to go first because there's something missing. Soldiers, you go first. Check. That's in the text. Ark, you go ahead of the people. Check. That's not missing. That's there. The priests were to go behind the ark. Check. That's there. That's what God told Joshua. The rear guard is to come behind everyone else. Check. That's there. Uh, don't make any noise while you're marching. No talking. Just march. They'll be blowing the trumpets. Check. That's there. Uh, until I say shout, then you will shout check. But there's one detail missing that God told Joshua, but Joshua didn't tell the people. And I got a feeling that's because God told Joshua to not tell the people. Now, that ain't recorded, but that's what I think. But what, what's missing? From what Joshua told the people. He told them every, the order, the marching order, what goes first, where the ark goes, where the rear guard does, where the armed soldiers go. What's missing? Yeah, if you'd have been here Wednesday, I gave you an answer. Yeah, say what you missed midweek. He didn't tell them how many days they were going to march. And that's a problem for us. Because when God says march, we, here's our first question, how long? <laughs> God says serve. How long, God? Uh, your man says we're to do X, Y, Z because you said to do X, Y, Z, but, but how long, God? One step at a time. For how long? Till I say shout. When I say shout, then you shout. Up until then, you just march. Don't make no noise, just march. They're going to blow the trumpet, just march. But God, I signed up to swing a sword. I didn't sign up for the marching band. March. Day one, this is pretty cool, man. We'll march around the city. We're about to take this thing. We got this. We got this. Can you hear them? Oh, we got this covered. Lap around the city. They go back to camp, hang out by the fire, eat, chill. Day two, Joshua says, all right, y'all get up. Let's go. Same order. Blow the trumpets. March. They march again. And they thought, man, this is weird. I thought we'd be you know, throwing Molotov cocktails a day. I thought we'd do something. I mean, and, and there's not, not a brick falling off the wall yet, not a door unlocked yet, no progress it seems. Uh, day three, after they sleep again, they get up day three, and they say, well, Joshua, what's the plan today? And he says, same thing it was yesterday, get up and march. Uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to do the same thing we did yesterday. Uh, we're going to march, we're going to walk, we're going to go ahead. Uh, but Joshua, we ain't made no progress. Well, God said march, let's march. Uh, <laughs> day four, 
Do y'all think Joshua's been out in the sun too long? Did he hear God right? Did he eat a burrito before he slept last night? Because I don't think God said march again. I think God said storm the city. Let's tear it up. Let's, let's take this thing. For God's glory, let's go kick some behind. You know what I'm saying? And day five, march around again. Same thing. And here's where we get. We get on day six. And Joshua missed God. We've missed God. We've been consistent, but I mean, not a single block has fallen. Not a, again, not a, not a boat undone on a door, not a, nothing, no progress. How many, how many of y'all are there? We're, we've been walking around a Jericho and it seems like, dear God in heaven, do you hear my prayers? I've been praying for this prodigal child for 10 years. It's not done a thing. God, I've been witnessing to my neighbor every day, all day for 365 days this year. And they still cuss me out every time I pull in my driveway. And you're just walking and you think, God, did you really call me to do this? We're seeing no growth. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I was here about two years with this church. And I thought, God, did you really call me here? We're not really seeing much of anything happen. I mean, we've done some things, but are we doing the right thing? I mean... I thought we would be full capacity by now. I thought we would have this going on by now. I thought we'd have that going on by now. I don't know. I think I've missed you. And when I went to beach vacation two years ago, I got on the internet and I looked for churches at the beach because I love Myrtle Beach. I love any beach. And I'm not a cold weather dude. And I thought, maybe I missed God. And he said, Myrtle Beach, not Hendersonville. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the more I pleaded my case before God and said, God, I think I've missed you. Here's what he spoke to my heart and my mind. Keep walking. I had an old preacher. I'll call his name. He might be watching. Ray Talley. He was interim here. And I told my problem to Ray Talley. And here's what Ray told me in old man terminology because he's 86. Keep plodding. So what's plodding, Ray? <laughs> Keep plowing. Keep working. Keep walking. Keep faithful. Keep moving. Keep going. Don't give up. Keep going. And I wasn't talking about leaving ministry. I was talking about leaving assignments because I thought, I, I thought maybe I've missed it. Maybe God said something else. Do you think that they thought that when they walked around the city six days and they said, we followed this man, God has used him in a mighty way. We've seen him do all kinds of things, but he has lost his ever-loving mind. Walls don't fall by walking, Joshua, unless God says so. And what we want to do is we want to stop on six, but our victory lap is predicated not just on a promise but it's also confirmed by our consistency because fear says stop. Just quit. Go somewhere else. Start over. Move away. Give up. Jericho's too big. The task is too big. You're not qualified. You're not equipped. And God the whole time is saying, exactly. You're not big enough. You're not equipped. You're not strong enough. You're not qualified, but I am. Do what I say do and walk. And walk. So faith is confirmed by consistency. Or we could say it this way. Ron Dunn introduced me to this statement. He's dead now, but he has mentored me in the past year through his online sermons and other things. And he said it this way. Will a, God, will a man serve God for nothing? Because here's when I love to serve God, when bricks are falling. I love serving God when walls are crumbling down. I love serving God when I can just see a crack in the mortar. I love serving God whenever I see one or two of my enemies fall off the wall and get hurt. I love serving God when I can see progress, but it's on those six days of nothing <laughs> that kills me. It's on those six days that I say, huh, and Israel's in the same place and they're following God and they're saying, did we hear him right? And he says, yes, your victory lap is not just confirmed by your consistency, but it's also determined by your direction. And verse 15 would give us that clue because it says, but it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on that day only they marched around the city seven times and the seventh time it happened. Now we've been marching around the city. Y'all with me? Y'all tired yet? Y'all out of breath? Some of y'all was out of breath and done passed out on me. We're walking around the city six days in a row, and this time Josh says, we ain't just walking one time a day, guys. We're going to walk seven. <laughs> as, if, as if another lap is going to make a difference, Joshua. It's God's direction on the seventh day. What are we going to do, Joshua? March again. You, got, you guessed right. March again. 
And have you, have you ever been there in your life? Because I don't want this to be a history lesson only. It's a real life happening in a real context with real people and a real God. But have you ever felt like, what did you individual doing here? I'm just going in circles. I'm making no progress. I mean, I am going in circles. Have you been there? Y'all really trying to make me come out there. This side's on board. This side, I don't know. We go in circles over here, so I might just preach to y'all. Forget about them. You feel like you're going in circles, making no progress, nothing's going on. How many times, here's what it sounds like in our lives, how many times am I going to fall into this sin? God, how many times have I got to forgive my wife, happy Valentine's Day, baby, in this marriage covenant that I'm in? How many times am I going to have to forgive my husband in this marriage covenant that I'm in? And you're circling the whole time, going in circles. How many times, God, am I going to have to have this speak to my children? Hank, June, <laughs> Millie. How many times, because I'm going in circles, I'm doing what I think you've called me to do, but I see no progress. I'm doing exactly what you told me to do. I am actually putting one step in front of the other, and I'm walking out my faith, but nothing is happening. My marriage is not getting better. It's getting worse. My parenting skills are not getting better. They're getting worse. Amen. I had a good preaching right there. I've been trying to lose weight, God, and I have cut out sugar for 60 days now, and I've gained 12 pounds. <laughs> I said I was going to get up at 5 a.m. this year, Lord, and spend time with you, and I hadn't peeled myself out of bed till 7.30 any given day. And we make these commitments, and we're following God, and we're doing our best, but our best ain't good enough, and that is the key to this text. Our best is not good enough because God's is. Jesus is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His death is sufficient. His sacrifice is sufficient. His sacrificial death is Covers it all. His raising from the dead gives us power to walk in victory. And we serve the God of direction because you say, I'm not making progress. I'm just going in circles. There's no victory in my life. There's no freedom. I'm just going in circles. Yes, you are. There's some encouragement. Yes, you are going in circles. Here is the key indicator that you're on target. You are going in circles, but... Opposed to popular opinion, it's not random. This is by design. You didn't just happen to wake up in the family that you're in. You didn't just happen to have those children under you. You didn't just happen to land that job that you've got. You just didn't happen to fall into that marriage that you have in the community that you're in and be a part of the church that you are. None of that is happenstance, coincidence, or just sheer luck. There's nothing random about God. And everything he does has a purpose and it's done on purpose. And when he says, walk, walk, well, I don't see progress. I'm going in circles. Yes, you are going in circles. But the reason you're going in circles is because I said so. And that's victorious Christian living. Going in circles. Well, I don't like that, preacher. I know. I don't either. But it's what he's called us to do. Walk in circles. Walk in circles. And the whole time, here's what we're here. We're walking in circles. I got to illustrate so y'all stick with me. We're walking in circles and... The enemy's saying, you look stupid. And we say, I am stupid. God says, walk forward. This is pointless, preacher. Why are you walking in circles? God said walk in circles. But, but preacher, we ought not to do it that way. We need to do it this way. Here's, here's what I think. No, here's what I think. And then God speaks this. No, here's what I say. March, go in another circle, another lap, another lap. When the enemy says, what are they doing down there? God says, walk another lap. And the enemy says, then people, they have been in the wilderness too long. I don't know what they had cooking over that fire last night, but it's got to them. They've gone plumb dumb crazy. God says, walk another lap, walk another lap, walk another lap, walk another lap, walk another lap. And he says here, here's the kicker. Every lap is the victory lap. If you're a believer, every lap is the victory lap. We're not looking to... Man, when we get to the end of our life, and I hope it's 100 for everybody in the room, unless you're ready to go now and you know Jesus, then I hope it's whenever he's ready for you. Everybody else, I hope it's 100. We're not waiting on a checkered flag for God to say, okay, now you can enter into victory. No, no. Every lap, every lap is the victory lap. Every lap we can walk in victory. Every lap 
is the last lap. If it's not, it, we should treat it like it's our last lap. Man, when I prepare a sermon and I'm trying to preach it, I preach it like it's going to be my last time to preach because it very well may be. And when we're living our lives every hour to be like our last hour. And every situation ought to be approached like it's our last situation. And every parenting situation we find ourselves in ought to be approached like it's our last parenting situation. And every marriage predicament ought to be treated like it's our last marriage predicament. And every station of life should be treated as the victory lap because if you're in Jesus, you already have victory. He said, I have given you the city. Walk in it. Well, preacher, it don't look like it. I remind you, New Testament, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Uh, we don't walk by fear, we walk by. We don't win battles by throwing punches. We win them by. The weapons of our warfare are not against flesh and blood. They're against principalities and powers of darkness. And there's only one way to defeat those enemies. By faith in Jesus. Because he has assured our victory. And every lap is our victory lap because of his promise because of his consistency, our consistency, his direction. Lastly, our obedience. Listen, verse 16. And the seventh time it happened when the, plea, pre, when the priest blew the trumpets. I'm getting so worked up I can't even read. They blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And then jump down to verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. I'm here to tell you today, don't stop on lap number six. Don't give up on lap number six. Don't stop one lap too soon. Don't give up one situation too soon. Don't give up an inch. Don't back up. Don't let up. Don't shut up. Don't let the enemy tell you to put up and pack up and go home. Keep marching. Keep marching because the victory lap is obtained by obedience. Now, if they had quit mar marching on day three, do you know what they'd have been living in? Where 90% of the church lived in disobedience. <laughs> That's hard to say. So a lot of us live in disobedience because God says go, and we say another word that rhymes with it. It starts with a different letter called no. There's a book in the Old Testament about that. It's a little man eaten by a big fish. Y'all remember that story? Oh, man, God's word cuts deep. Hit dog hollers. God says go, and we say no. That victory lap, the only way we're going to walk in victory is if we're walking in obedience. If you're not walking in obedience, you're walking in disobedience. There is no other way around it. When God says go and you say no, you're now living in a life of disobedience, and you have opened up your life for the enemy to come in and plunder your goods. Because you've now started living in fear, not faith. Because faith says, I believe what God says. Fear says, I believe what I think and what they say. That's what I'm going to act on. I'm not going to act on what God says. Why? How can you prove that, preacher? Because he says, I have given you the city. If they believed everything the enemy shouted to them, they wouldn't have had the city. Do you know how they got the city? Obedience. Obeying God. Do you know how you have victory in your life? Obeying God. Is it really that simple, preacher? Yes, it is. I'll go a step further, and here's a hard pill to swallow, and we've got to land this plane, but you believe no more of God's word than you obey. Well, I thought this was supposed to be a chandelier swinging, hanky-waving sermon. Well, it is, but a life of faith is a life of obedience. You see, it wasn't their shout that made the walls fall. We can shout that we blew in the face and pass out and kick around on the floor. Ain't nothing going to happen, Captain. The reason the walls fell is because they were obedient to do what God says do. And they marched when it looked stupid. They followed God when it looked pointless. They did what God said whenever it was certainly opposing their own ideas and the word of the enemy, but they followed God by faith. And when God said shout, their shout didn't break the wall, their enemy didn't break the wall, and they themselves did not break the wall. God broke the wall. The wall fell flat. It wasn't an earthquake that broke it. It was God that broke it. He broke the wall. It was obtained by obedience. So how do we have that? How do we have victory in our life? Because fear says quit. Faith says shout. Fear says give up. Faith says go on. Fear says this is ridiculous. Faith says I am victorious. And I'll go ahead and tell you to be victorious most of the time. You've got to look ridiculous. Y'all do know what they say about us, don't you? The Bible is antiquated and outdated. As a matter of fact, they should just go ahead and take the first half, which we've been preaching from quite a bit here lately, the Old Testament, and just go ahead and can that because that was about a different people in a different time. 
All we need to do is, you know, positive thinking and good living. Here's the problem. Neither one of those are possible apart from God. Here we see a real-life story about a real-life army that really walked, marched around a city that God really defeated for them, and the walls came down, and we've seen how to apply it to our lives. How we do it, preacher, is one step at a time. We do it by faith, not fear. We follow God in what he says. Fear doubts and disobeys. Faith believes and obey. And I remind you, I remind you, if God has called you to march, every lap is the victory lap. There's not one waiting on you. That's why the Jordan does not represent heaven. And I'm not trying to bash an old hymn. I'm trying to tell you that victory does not happen when you die and wind up in heaven with God for eternity. That is a good thing. That's gravy. Victory is every day when you encounter the enemy that you walk by faith and not by sight and you realize that God has called me to this. God will see me through this. He has not left me. He has not deserted me. And when the world says there's no such thing as a God, that book that you carry, that book that you believe, that book that you've staked your life on is a bunch of malarkey. I will walk by faith. I will have victory in my life because God has called me to it. And I'm going to do it one step at a time, and I'm not waiting for a victory lap, a victory lap, a victory lap when I die. I'm not waiting for them to wave the checkered flag and say, you're done when I'm dead. I'm starting my victory lap now, and every time I circle, it's the victory lap. Every time I go around that problem, it's the victory lap. And I understand when you're circling, you see that enemy on your west side, and then you turn and you see that enemy on your west side, and then you turn and you see it. <laughs> And you can't get away from the enemy when you're circling it because it's all you can see and the problem is all you can see, but right over the wall is the promise that God has for you. Don't stop on six. Don't stop on the sixth lap. Don't stop a lap too soon. Every lap is the victory lap. And you'll see God will make walls fall flat. That prodigal, you'll see them. They'll return. You'll see that relationship that was broken be mended. God will give you the opportunity to speak into that life again. God will give you the influence to impact that life again. God will restore what the canker worm has eaten. He'll redeem what's been lost. He'll restore what's been broken. He'll heal what's been killed. He can bring it back to life. He is resurrection. It's not a concept. It's a person. And he can breathe his breath on any situation. Make walls fall down. And here's all you got to do. Walk through. Walk in the promise. Walk in the promise. Walk in victory. Well, how do I walk in victory? By obedience. How does that happen? It's built on a promise. Do you believe the promise of God for your life? He says you're a sinner headed for hell. You're worthy, no good scoundrel. You ain't never done nothing good in your life. I don't care how good you think you are, how many churches you attended, how many roles your name's on, how many good deeds you've done. I don't care how many old ladies you helped cross the parking lot. I don't care how many cuss words you ain't said, how many bottles you ain't drunk, how many bags you ain't smoked. It ain't nothing about that. Here's not what it's about. It's about a promise that God says, you're unworthy, I'm worthy. Here's how you become worthy, Jesus. I let him die so that you could live. Can you believe that? God let his son die so that you, a lousy, no good for nothing sinner, could live? He did that for you. It's all predicated on a promise. The victory lap is if you don't believe the promise, you'll never have victory. There's consistency. When God says, march, march, one foot in front of the other and keep going. Keep going. It's okay to question God, but it's never okay to disobey God. I doubt. I doubt many times. I, I exposed my doubt earlier. Am I at the right place? Is this the right time? Am I doing what you called me to do? Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. Consistency. It's confirmed by consistency. His consistency, number one. Yours, number two. It's determined by direction. He's called you to this crazy nonsense. He's called you to this that makes no sense. He's called you to this husband that walked out. He's called you to this family that's fallen apart. He's called you to this marriage that has ended in divorce. He's called you to this situation that looks impossible. He's called you to the gates of the enemy. It's his direction. It wasn't Joshua's idea. It's God's idea. Lastly, it's obtained by obedience. What does that mean, preacher? That means every time God says, Thou shalt not, that means I love you. Stay away from it or it's going to kill you. Every time God says, here's what I command, it means walk in it or you're going to be living in disobedience. If you want victory, follow me because I've promised it to you. I'm consistent and I'm faithful always. It's my idea and my direction. And lastly, your part is to obey. Again, Joshua is where we see the living God letting sinful man 
join in partnership with him and move forward. The victory is not ours. The victory is his. We just get to walk in it. Let every lap be your victory lap. Father, I thank you. I praise you for Joshua. I pray we've made sense today. I pray that you have, Lord, touched hearts, minds, lives. Lord, today we've been impacted by your word. I pray you'd give us wisdom, discernment, and nerve to move on it. Lord, that we would take it and we would believe it and we would digest it and we would act upon it because to only hear your word is not good enough. We must do your word. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name that he would get glory. Amen. If you'd stand to your feet, I think we have a song keyed up. If you'd stand to your feet, bow your heads, close your eyes. It's just now 12 o'clock, and Miss Mary's going to fill in in a pinch again. But you stand to your feet, close your, close your eyes, bow your head. This is an invitation. So I just want to remind you, as you're standing with your head bowed, your eyes closed, that we're inviting you. We're inviting you to do business with God. We're inviting you to walk another lap. We're inviting you to take a step of faith. This is an invitation. You don't have to tell me a thing unless you want to, but we're inviting you. If you want to know what church membership looks like here, come talk to me. If you say, I don't have a relationship with the living God like you preached about today, come talk to me. I can tell you what God's Word says. Or maybe you just need to come to the altar and get some things straight with God. You don't have to approach me. You don't have to tell me. You just come. We're inviting you. As she continues to play, we're going to continue to stand. Heads bowed, eyes, eyes closed. The invitation is wide open. You move as you see fit and the Spirit leads.